Hello, this is Mark Lieberman, the host of The World According to Mark, brought to you through the studio of WPVM LP, WPVM in Asheville 103.7, and streaming on WPVMFM.org. My guest today is Drew Kostick. Drew's in the studio, and we're going to talk to him about his life in legal slash brewing. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll explain what that means later but thanks for being on the show drew ah uh, thank you for having me i'm so excited to be here so drew is a in-betweener at this moment um he has been living in raleigh for some period of time and he is uh, going to shortly very shortly be a resident of Asheville. um what uh what precipitated the move and then we'll move backward in time to tell you for you to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, well, there, there's a couple factors. Um, one, Asheville, personally, is just the perfect town for me. Uh, Like-minded people, outdoors uh, events, great music, great food, and of course, the best beer in the country, uh, at least the East Coast, if not the country, I would say. Um, and then the the other factor is I, I found my dream job, um, working at Archetype, becoming the head brewer at Archetype. Uh, it's exactly where I want to be, exactly the level of brewery I want to interact with. And uh, I want to I want to put my chops up <clears throat> on the table and, and see how I do against the best out there, because uh, I want to see how my recipes fare with some of the best beer drinkers. And um, I really think we're going to make something shine at Archetype. And I, I'm beyond excited to be there both personally and professionally. So um, what makes Archetype um, what made it seem the best fit for you or the best generally or unique because as you mentioned there are a ton i don't know how many a ton is but there are a ton <laughs> of breweries uh in and around Asheville. oh sure i mean again this is the nerdy aspect of it for me i've seen a fair amount of brew houses i've worked at several different breweries of course across my brewing career and uh this is by far and away the prettiest most functional uh just best system to ever work on. I can't wait to dial it in and really start producing what I think can be some great beer. Uh, the community of West Asheville has been so incredibly welcoming. I can't even stress that enough, how friendly and wonderful everybody's been. Um, and then it's the philosophy behind the beer. Uh, at Archetype, we're brewing beers for everybody. We're not brewing a, a little niche beer here or there, but we're brewing beer so that anybody who wants to walk in and learn about beer can try their hand from a Pilsner to uh, the darkest of stouts. I like to say I love to brew a beer rainbow and I love to make every beer uh, not engage in palate fatigue. So every beer allows you to drink two of them at least uh, rather than destroying your palate off of uh, overarching ingredient inclusion. Rather, I want people to really get to sit and think about their beer and embrace the experience of actually drinking and hopefully the experience of meeting people in the tap room. I find, and granted, I talk too much for my own good, uh, you're striking up conversations with strangers everywhere to the degree that it reminds me of an English pub. And that was what I was really looking for in a tap room experience that I could come take harness over. And uh, I'm overjoyed. It's everything I could want in one place. I, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. <laughs> So oh, I I've never heard of palate fatigue before. Um, I didn't know whether I, I don't know if it, whether I have palate fatigue. Uh, I might I might have to trademark it because I think I made up the term. But the idea for me is I will sit no matter what style of beer I make, no matter how high the ABV or the low the ABV is. I'd like to sit with a full glass of it, and after that beer, can I and will I go and order another? And um, a lot of times, and I'm not to knock any brewer specifically, everybody's on their own path. Uh, some people will like to pack beer full of hops to the degree that it doesn't fit my palate. And it seems like I can drink one of them or maybe even half of one of them, but I can't go much further than that. And I seek to make this an experience for people to be able to grow beyond just a little bit of beer. Okay, so what is an ABV? Uh, ABV, alcohol by volume, that's basically your percentage of alcohol. Okay. I, I thought it might have been something like an ABM uh, ballistic missile, but 
any of that. <laughs> well, some of our double IPAs, their ABVs might become like APM. So you never know. Uh, that might be the case. Uh, depends on how deadly they can be. And I, I tend to get up into the 9.5% when I make a double IPA or a, um, a Belgian Golden Strong. And yeah, those could be a missile if you're not careful with them. Okay. Well, um, you've already sort of revealed a little bit about your personality. Um, you use the term nerd. Why don't we just say <laughs> that you're sort of a little strange, but maybe not strange for Asheville. Um, I'm, I told you I found my people. That's why. Okay. Well, I've, I've read the stories on you. You, uh, as you say, you've been welcome to, uh, Asheville. I don't know whether you're walking around with a sandwich sign in West Asheville saying, follow me <laughs> to, the, to the brewery or, or what, but a lot of people, um, have been talking about you even, uh, before you, uh, graduated from what I'm going to refer to as beer school. And you'll tell me what that really means. But mm -hmm. but as a youngster, um, like youngster, like 15, according to what I read, you became enamored with Buddhism or the Buddhist text or whatever. And you learned um, you learned a lot about that. And I don't at, a, at 15, what what was wrong in your in your world that caused you to take <laughs> that tangential shift? Most people were just uh, dating and playing playing softball. Yeah, again, a, a little on the strange side. Um, and uh, I honestly, it, it was a class in high school, my sophomore year in high school. Uh, I learned a little bit about Taoism, and it just started a roller coaster ride. I'm probably more on the neurotic, anxious side, so it's almost aspirational for me to focus on mindfulness and Buddhism and the whole notion of, of really centering oneself and living in the moment because my brain is scattered in 18 different directions at all times, including the middle of the night. And so this is a reminder to stay grounded. And it's also something that's crept into my brewing philosophies. Uh, uh, quickly, the notion of Buddhism started with the idea of the middle way. Uh, the Buddha apparently at the time of his enlightenment heard a guitar being played on the river and he thought about life as a guitar string. If you tune it too tight, it'll snap. If you leave it too loose, it'll be too slack to play. What you're looking for is that middle way, that harmonic resonance with the universe. And at the chance of making myself sound far more grandiose than I am, uh, I look to find that in beer. Again, we talk about palate fatigue. That's the string getting too tight or too loose on, on your guitar. What I want to find is that middle way where the ingredients interact har harmoniously and uh, really play with your your tongue, your mouth, your your senses, and, and everything you're doing uh, at the time so that you are in the moment of drinking that beer, uh, not running off to think about 12 different other things. Okay, well, thanks for bringing up the guitar. You can probably see it a bit in the background. Right? <laughs> so I just put my way, it's behind uh, me too. Well, my biggest issue with it is um, remembering to practice. So I, I took up the instrument twice in my adult life and, um, you know, I was, never very good at it and then <laughs> that makes two of us and now i started up again but uh breaking the trance and going over and picking it up has been my biggest challenge but that's a lot different than what you described um with taoism so let's move forward with uh what you started doing with your life is you decided to go to, to college uh, you went to colgate uh for those of you in the south who haven't heard of it that is not a toothpaste and <laughs> And you majored in psychology, and yes. and then you you got back into uh, Tibet and something called core Tibet. I don't know what that means, but why don't you tell us about your course of study and how the the Tibetan thing played on with that? Yeah, so uh, I I knew for a fact I wanted to study abroad. It was travel has been a big big part of my life and continues to be so through my adult life. Um, and I also knew um, I didn't want it to be a very generic study abroad process. Uh, and again, with me in high school, dreaming about Buddhism, learning about Tibet, I thought, wow, this would be really cool. But chances are that's never going to happen. It's so hard to get into there. It's, it's the Chinese are very restrictive. I lucked out and I found a program through University of Virginia and Columbia University that accepted me um, to then study abroad in Tibet the fall of my junior year. I spent that summer in between sophomore and junior year of college. Uh, let's see, what was it? Six hours a day, five days a week, maybe nine hours a day, five days a week, taking intensive Tibetan language courses. Oh, sorry, six hours a day, five days a week for nine weeks. 
learning the Tibetan language, the Tibetan alphabet. And then I uh, had with the experience of my life, I, I sometimes almost wish I was older than 20 years old uh, to have gotten to live in Tibet for four months, which I, I'm, again, beyond blessed in the sense that I got to live there for longer than most Tibetan scholars who are teaching professors have ever gotten to visit. And I saw some of the craziest things I will ever see. I, I still think back on that time and, and with the fondest of memories and you know, the, the grit and determination, but it really taught me a lot about myself, a lot about the world and, and really opened my eyes to, um, to different lifestyles because I always like to say it was like living in bizarro land. Think about everything that's normal in your life and turn it upside down. That's what it's like to live in Tibet sometimes. Well, let me ask you this. Um, first of all, for those just uh, tuning in, this is uh, Drew Kostick, who is uh, working these days as a master brewer for Archetype Brewery in Asheville um, and has a, a very interesting story to tell about his life up until now. What is the most impactful thing that you got out of your t Tibetan experience? I mean, you, you say it's a crazy place and so on and so forth, and most of us don't have much knowledge of it except... <laughs> We know George Harrison studied with the Dalai Lama, and we know that China generally has a repressive attitude towards Tibetans. But what what did you get out of it? Um, God, infinite amount of growth. Again, twenty years old. Uh, not my second time, I think, out of the country ever, or I guess the third time if you count Montreal when I was a kid or some of the islands um, down in the Bahamas, but really the second time across into the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, and you learn a lot about what communism is like uh, living in a, an authoritarian regime. Uh, we had the military patrol on our bus twice, which pretty scary, uh, a lot of scary stories, but you also see um, resilience and um, just the sublime. There's something about being, I mean, Lhasa alone was 12,000 feet up. The highest point I ever reached was something like 17,000 feet. And just being in, a, in an atmosphere that is entirely different than your comfort zone. There's no atmosphere. Grows, there's no atmosphere. Yeah, there's no atmosphere. Feet. <laughs> Believe it or not, literally the sky is a darker shade of blue because you're in another level of atmosphere, which is still mind boggling to me these days. Uh, but you, uh, there's a level of resilience, especially about being that young that you learn to deal with. Um, you know, sometimes the food isn't cooked properly and you don't have medicine. So our medicine was Sprite and Coca-Cola. And that's how you settled your stomach if you had a bad uh, reaction to some food. And you just, it, it, just um, different ways of life that uh, humans, literally people who are the exact same as you and me are living that could be, that are so drastically different. I remember taking pictures of young children in um, in remote villages and having them look at them and then take, ask me to take pictures again and realizing that this was the first time these individuals had probably ever seen their own image uh, because they grew up basically without mirrors as well. And um, just uh, the, the population's interest in us matching our interest in the population, again, self-growth being a big factor, learning how to be on my own in, in a vastly different country, uh, all led to um you know an ability and and spurred this excitement to travel in me and i will say lots of beer it's a very simple basic generic lager but it was delicious and uh you have two of those at that altitude and you'll stop feeling them i can promise you that so while you were in tibet um according to again what i read you you actually met or the dalai lama came to the, the campus where you were at is that true uh, so no, just slight, slight alteration. So the Dalai Lama unfortunately had to flee in 1959, uh, China and Tibet. He's been living in exile in India, but uh, I was beyond lucky that he was a personal friend of an alumni of Colgate who had just donated a building and uh, had convinced the Dalai Lama to come to Colgate to give a speech. And I weaseled my way into administration and said, guys, I'm the only person here within probably 100 and 150 miles that actually speaks Tibetan. Let me welcome him on behalf of the students. And I got to have lunch with the Dalai Lama, speak to him in Tibetan, tell him about my experiences in Tibet, which, I mean, talk about shock and awe to have one of the most important political figures of that 
the, the most important political figure of that country, one of the most important political figures, arguably, of the 20th century, ask my opinion on what his home country was going through. Uh, I mean, I was I was floored. I was I felt like I was on cloud nine. <laughs> In fact, my professor from Core Tibet, the, the program that I studied at as a sophomore at Colgate, um, when we were in the line to meet the Dalai Lama and he first walked in, he just turned to me and goes, just don't faint because it is really like being in the presence of holiness. It's quite incredible to meet that individual. So you went, uh, Drew, through this uh, life altering experience, mind expansion experience, um, immersed yourself in a language that few people speak uh, and in a country and a history that few people know about and saw your life in a, a new perspective. And then um, you decided to uh, go to law school. So I, I could see how that can work. I mean, why wouldn't that be the next step? Go to law school, become a corporate lawyer, you know, go to a Wall Street type firm, whether it's in DC or otherwise. How did that happen? Was that was that yeah? Was that a mistake in retrospect? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to call it a mistake. But let's I'll I'll go with Bob Ross and call it a happy little accident. Um, but it was um, it was a lifestyle choice that I made. Uh, I thought about going into psychology. Um, I always, and I thought psychology was a good progress to law school. I had actually been, I mean, I was tie dyeing and being a hippie a lot in college too. Obviously my foray in Tibet uh, led into that. And uh, I really wanted to get into international environmental law. Unfortunately, something I found out during my first year of law school is uh, to be an environmental lawyer, you either have to work for the oil companies or you can't pay back your loans. And I needed to pay back my loans. I'm still paying back my loans, in fact. Um, and I, obviously that's a gross oversimplification, but it was a little disheartening and kind of sent me in a tailspin in trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and what path I needed to follow. Okay, so you get out of law school, you had an interest in environmental law and you went to uh, Duke. Yeah, you know, Duke yes. Law School, which is obviously a, a prestigious law school. You have to work hard to get through it. You have to be smart to, to get into it. And tell me, you we talked about this off air. You mentioned a Fulbright scholarship. Where, yes. where, where did that come in in this process? So that was the year in between college and law school. Uh, I knew I wanted to take a gap year before going back to school. Um, I'll tell you, and this this sounds silly, but it, it is partially the truth. I got really jealous of all my friends in Europe when they studied abroad and did those traditional study abroads and got to travel to all, you know, 12, 15 countries in four months or something. I thought, well, I can't leave China. I'm not allowed to even leave Tibet. And while we did do a lot of traveling around central Tibet, my itch wasn't satisfied. And so part of my interest in pursuing the Fulbright is was can I live abroad again? Can I live abroad in Europe and go explore the rest of the world? And then the other, there was the psychology aspect. I ended up teaching English and psychology at a small university in Warsaw, Poland, uh, and was able to really interact with people. Now, I'll tell you the truth, being 22 years old and teaching college level psychology and English scares the living pants out of you. And I dare say that was even more of a formative year for me than uh, my four months in Tibet because I found myself learning how to truly be an adult because there was no safety net whatsoever. And we're talking the heart of the recession too. I left in fall of 2008, right when everything was, excuse my language, going to hell. <laughs> so it was, it was um, an interesting time for the country an interesting time for me. And uh, it was exploratory, uh, trying to find my way while applying to law school at the same time. So maybe bucking trends or the law school, big corporate lawyer trend in my actions, but still falling on, along the path in my actual uh, written work. So you described the Fulbright as if it was uh, somewhat of a travel visa for you. I'm sure that's not the whole thing. To get a Fulbright scholarship, you not only have to be smart and outstanding and wonderful don't you have to have a sort of a mission or objective or did they just simply assign you the responsibility for going to, to poland to teach english what so was there, were, there are two different uh two different types of fulbright there is one primarily for professors uh who will go over and teach at a university and then there's one for younger individuals like myself at the time 
called an ETA, an English teaching assistant. Now, the idea was I was supposed to do research on the psychology of linguistics as well as aid a professor at the university I was working at. I got there my very first day of classes. They called me in 30 minutes before and they just said, oh, yeah, you're just teaching this all by yourself. Uh, your classroom's down the hall. Go, good luck. And um, it was crazy. It was, it was nuts to really dig my feet in and my hat's off to all teachers out there, that's for sure. Uh, their jobs are very, very difficult creation of a curriculum, trying to engage student minds. It is not easy, and it, I struggled with it wholeheartedly, but it was quite an experience. Um, and then there's the, op, the, the overarching goal, I should say, of the Fulbright Scholarship is um, bringing Americans to other places of the world and people from other places of the world to America and sharing a dialogue. And so there is a statesman, stateswoman aspect to it, too, that I very much enjoyed. Um, I spent a lot of time with people who were not American, and it's something you don't get the chance to do often on your study abroad. You have your clique of study abroad people in college that you go out with, and maybe you'll interact with some of the locals. I, I get no safety net. Um, I met two of my best friends there who were Belgian. I met tons of Polish friends that I still keep in touch with. And uh, it was it was quite the experience. And I, again, beyond lucky to be even given the shot to get out there. So when your uh, tour of duty, so to speak, was done uh, teaching English um, in Poland, uh, you came back to the States and applied for, perhaps you already had applied for law school and you went through law school and what were you what were you searching for? What, what did you think would be your your home? What were you interested in? Well, and that was the difficult part. I, I truth be told, I did not find the study of law to be as engaging as I had hoped it would have been. Um, I did log on. Now, I told you about my my brief experience trying to become an international environmental lawyer that kind of flamed out. And I, again, I was looking for a purpose in finding this degree. And one thing that really, really struck me was international criminal law, um, the prosecution of individuals for genocide, uh, all stemming from the Nuremberg trials in World War II. Uh, through the Yugoslavia trials of the 90s, which the, actually the court just finished up their final trials there at the tribunal, I should say, Rwanda, and then the establishment of the International Criminal Court. And uh, I was lucky enough to, again, run across to Europe when I was in law school, and I actually was able to intern at the office of the chief prosecutor of the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, ICTY, uh, and that, I mean, talk about finding meaning in the pursuit of law to know that you're at, you're doing something brand new in the world that had only been done once before, and that was at Nuremberg, and to know that you're helping bring to justice and also bring peace to victims of some of the most horrific atrocities to occur in the 90s and even through into the early 2000s. Um, if you're looking for purpose, that's one to find. Okay. And then you went um, to work for a law firm or yes. And you ex had an experience at more than one law firm. And what were you doing? Yes, I bounced with them? around. Okay. What were you doing with them? Corporate law? Uh, I started, laws? Yep. Started in securities litigation, did a lot of white collar crime work, breach of contract. I was a litigator, so I did kind of the courtroom stuff, but you know, not a lot of people realize, though I'm sure you do. You don't actually end up in the courtroom all that often. About 80% of the cases never make it past the initial pleadings. Um, so it, a lot of writing, um, a lot of learning about office politics, uh, and a lot of growing up in New York City. Um, I was born in New York City, grew up right outside in the suburbs, had always wanted to be back in the city, becoming a quote unquote real New Yorker. And uh, I got that for the eight years that I was there in the city. Um, six of which, uh, I guess five to six of which I was practicing law. Okay. And something about the, your experience practicing law um, was not in sync with what you ended up deciding you wanted to do. Um, and so there's a bridge somewhere uh, between law and beer. Um, yes. But, but you'd had some early experience with beer and brewery. 
you had a you had a brewery chemistry set i gather or something along those lines yes yep i've been a home brewer <laughs> since i was 21 years old nearly like three months after my 21st birthday i caught the bug and uh you know the bridge was built uh both in poland and believe it or not to tie it back in buddhism as well um poland I, I mentioned i met two of my best friends in the world the barts they are belgian flemish belgian um they taught me a world about beer in fact i remember the first time they brought beer back from a trip to belgium so that i could try it and uh they sat there and they started screaming at each other which i don't know if you're familiar with flemish it is not a very pretty language it is quite guttural uh, and they weren't angry at each other for the type of glass or the type of beer they were pouring for me, but the angle at which they were pouring the beer because they feared the head was not going to be the appropriate two fingers. And they got into a fight over that. And I sat there and thought, man, there's really something to this. There is a culture. Now, you know, Poland being right next to Germany as well, um, I just started enveloping myself in all of this rich history of the beer culture of Europe. And I, as I like to say in my Alice in Wonderland moment, I fell down the rabbit hole and I still haven't gotten out. I keep digging deeper into it. And so that was really what brought me into, brought my home brewing up to another level. Um, and then the Buddhist aspect uh, goes back to actually my senior honors thesis in college. Uh, I wrote about death anxiety, which is uh, more of a Western notion in that we are afraid to discuss death, our own death, or think about our own death because it's scary. It makes us anxious. It's, it shows that we're finite. We're not gonna live forever. And one thing that Buddhism has taught me is that death can become a motivating factor, in fact, to go pursue those goals because you don't know what's coming around the corner tomorrow. You have to live in the moment because there might not be a second moment coming afterwards. And uh, as I used to like to say in New York, and again, people <laughs> hated hearing this, I was like, I could get hit by a taxi tomorrow do I really want to go to Buddha, Muhammad, God, whoever's running the show and say, I did pretty great up until I became a lawyer and then my life kind of petered out. No, that wasn't, I only have one trip around the globe and I want to make the most of it. And that was when I finally felt the stirring inside of me to realize I have to jettison this legal career and I have to pursue something that I truly have a passion for. Okay, well, you're, your concern about going to Buddha or Muhammad or whatever um, after death um, uh, is probably misplaced because lawyers, as we all know, do not get into heaven. <laughs> right. Well, here's what I got going for me. I'll tell you what, I've been blessed by the Pope in Rome uh, when he did the big public gathering. So I got that. Been blessed by the Dalai Lama, of course, got to have lunch with him. And when I was in Tibet, I was on a, in a cave in a mountain that apparently because I drank the sacred water from it, I'm going to be reborn into the God realm. So, so far, I mean, I'm locking this up. I'm doing pretty okay. I think I got to make it to Mecca or something, you know, to keep, keep it rolling to make sure I've covered all my bases, but I think I'm doing all right. Okay. Well, go to Israel and hit both the so-called occupied territories and Israel. And I'm sure there's a yes. bre brewery close to the Wailing Wall, but in any event, not, <laughs> not, not to be sacrilegious. So in any event, you decided you were interested in beer, not just as a hobby, not just as something in, inspirational, but beer as a, as a productive business. And um, so at, at some point while you were going to law school, you decided you were going to pursue uh, beer, uh, the, the, the study of beer. And what better place to study beer than Auburn University, which is primarily known <laughs> for football. And uh, Bear Bryant, if I've got my coaches right. Um, so, so Bear Bryant is, is Alabama. Oh, he's, he's they, well, then now I, <laughs> I just I just did it. I don't I don't know who the most famous coach is at Auburn, but I know that I know that they do football there. But they apparently also do beer, and actually the two aren't completely as distinct as one might have thought. So again, for those tuning in, you're going to hear the story about his. Uh, Beer Odyssey, um, Beer Odyssey, Greek. I'm sure they were drinking beer in, in Greece. In I'm Greece. very big uh, fan of that book and Greek mythology. So that's the best way to put it. <laughs> Drew Kostic, he uh, was a former lawyer, probably still licensed somewhere, but he's also a master brewer and pursuing that at Archetype Brewery in Asheville. So tell us about the decision that you made to um, sort of tear yourself away from the practice of law and into the field of brewing. 
Well, I knew this was not something that was going to, to use a legal term, unwind very easily. Uh, I had made the deal with the devil, uh, you know, wink, wink, of, of law school loans. And it was something that I really needed to pay attention to and also find a way to transition my career. So it took me about four full years uh, going from full-time lawyer to finally quitting the last law firm and becoming a full-time brewer. Uh, most of that time was spent saving money. <clears throat> then uh, I transitioned to a federal job out of the big law firms so that I had some free time to go to school. I then, as you mentioned, applied to Auburn Brewing School for or Auburn's graduate school for brewing operations and brewing sciences which at the time I was part of the third class to actually ever take this course. It was brand new, the first, and I believe still the only part-time remote program that adults can do to achieve, uh, at my time, a master's certificate in brewing sciences and brewing operations, and now a full-blown master's degree uh, that you can achieve after two years of the program. Um, and so part of the, the struggle was making sure my day job allowed me to do homework uh, on top of it. and. I didn't get a whole lot of rest those days, but I fell, fell in love. I, if I could have fallen even more in love with the topic, uh, just to study the subject matter and knew I was moving forward in a direction that resonated with me, gave me infinite energy and ability just to continue to work and practice and play while still holding down a day job. and. Being able, what was wonderful about it is not only was there schooling in sciences and facility management, but also we wrote business plans as part of opening our own brewery and working with the tax laws and such like that. And then most importantly, and I can't stress this enough for anybody who's seeking to be a brewer, is the hands-on experience. There was a required, uh, I believe it was 200 hour internship that we had to do. And I always like to say to people, you can learn all you want from the books, but brewing is still an apprenticeship. And until you turn that first dry clamp, you don't fully know what it's like to be a brewer. And so that was a crucial component um, in addition to all my quote unquote book learning that uh, I really, really resonate. So uh, shout out to Strong Rope Brewery up in Brooklyn um, for giving me that opportunity. So your, uh, your initial course of study, learning uh, the brewery, uh, issues is the science of brewery, brewery and the other uh, associated business aspects all that was done online or virtually or did you yes okay and then it's uh, we did we had a one week intern or uh, i should say uh, orientation trip that we actually went out to colorado because uh one of the greatest in my opinion auburn graduates is actually dale from oscar blues the the name behind dale's pale ale he is an Auburn graduate and an Auburn MBA, and he really helped stir this program into existence. And so we were lucky enough to go out to Longmont, Colorado and visit his facility as well as several others as our orientation. And, you know, anybody who's been through orientation has to play the name game or something knows that this was a special orientation to go out and drink some of the best beer in the country. So after you completed your uh, course of study at Auburn, got your certificate, um, and you had to do the internship and you did your internship, did you say at a brewery in, in New York? Yes. Yeah. At the time I was living in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, then what, what was next for you or how did you just, where, where were you headed? The next step was trying to find somebody who's willing to take a chance on me. Um, again, it's an, it's an insular field. It's very difficult to get into brewing from the outside. You usually, Kind of have to grow up in it um and i was lucky enough to find that opportunity at, at a brew pub in brooklyn uh that they were willing to take a chance on me as an assistant brewer part-time to start with so i was still working at a law firm i'd since left my government job and gone back to a law firm I was working there five days a week uh from probably nine to six nine to seven three days a week i'd leave make sure i left at six to get to the brewery at 6 30 and work 6 30 to 10 30 and then i'd be there all sunday from 10 30 to 6 30. so i like to say at that time period whenever i had free time which was never i'd sleep and but again this this stirring inside of me um the ability to do something that i cared so much about and dreamt so much about it gave me an exuberance worth of energy i i couldn't go beyond it now i have to say 
I'd never drank coffee before there. And now I have my morning cup of coffee every day because I needed to have an afternoon cup of coffee every day that I was going to the brewery then. So it did give me a little bit of a vice, but frankly, it was all worth it because I knew I was pursuing my dream and, and what I was really seeking to do with the rest of my life. And so boundless energy as a result of that inner stirring. I'm sure you figured out a way to combine coffee with uh, beer, but we'll talk about that in a second. So you oh, I've got some fun. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> so you were with uh, a company or a brewery called Circa Brewing in yes. Brooklyn. And what I'm reading here is that that brewery, while you were there, um, was awarded something called the Rupert's Cup. Award, yes. Awarded once a year to the best brewery in New York. And I, I, I take it, again, with all appropriate modesty that you, you were... Uh, heavily responsible for that, them receiving that award. I I pushed a pretty strong campaign to make sure that we received that award. I was it was something that meant the absolute world to me. Um, uh, you know, I I grew up voting in that. Grew up grew up in the New York City beer industry, voting for that. While I was a lawyer, going to all the events of New York City Beer Week, and to be uh, for for that crescendo to happen, to be given the Rupert's Cup and. To really be, uh, you know, even just acknowledged as a full-time real brewer, as opposed to this uh, moonlighting lawyer who thinks he can brew, and maybe I don't know, he seems a little strange. He's a little off his rocker. Um, it, it was just a, it was the culmination of so many different things that uh, I couldn't ask for anything better than that, really. Well, let me ask you this now that we sort of opened this up and we keep talking about breweries and brewers and you're a master brewer. Um, for those uh, in my audience who are less knowledgeable about beer than I am, which is probably maybe two people um, who are less knowledgeable about beer than what, what what is a brewer? What does a brewer do? And what is the difference between a run of the mill brewer and a master brewer? Well, I, I, well, I'll start with the latter because uh, I should clarify, I don't consider myself a master brewer. In fact, I there is a test through the International Brewers and Distillers Guild that you can sit for to achieve the actual rank of master brewer, much like a master sommelier or master cicerone. Um, and so I, I have not sat for that test. Going to Auburn actually qualified me to sit for the test. I just would have to, I think I have to go to London to do it. So I, I also just like to think of myself as, as a simple brewer. I just like to make beer. I'm no, I'm no master of anything. My masters are yeast okay. and yeast is my real boss. Uh, and that's what makes beer. Brewers make sugar water, yeast makes beer. Uh, and so that's, that's the way I like to look at it. And I'm also, I'd like to be humbled by the fact that I was, I'm even able to enter this field that so few people have access to. And uh, it means, the world to me. It was a lot of work to get here. Don't get me wrong, but, but um, just to be called a brewer is is recognition enough. Uh, now, brewers in general, of course, uh, we're a strange sort of folk. Uh, we love to clean. That case in point, I use the term glorified janitor frequently. Uh, we look cool, but really what we're doing for the most part is keeping our space clean and sanitary, again, to let the boss do their work. And that boss is a microcellular organism called yeast that I find to be one of the most fascinating creatures in existence. And I, I it's that, it's playing with a lot of water, um, trying to fix a lot of mechanical things that you have no idea how to fix, but you're learning on the run. It's, it's what's beautiful about it is you're not behind a desk every day. You are out and you're on the move and every day is different because you don't know what problems or logistical questions are gonna creep up on you. And you're constantly learning in that process. So um, yeast is all around. I, I believe, I believe yes. yeast is actually in the air. Um, and we know that people use yeast for bread and we know that yeast um, has a more pernicious side, it can cause various diseases, but none of that is yep. relevant necessarily to to beer or beer making, but, and maybe it is, but what, what, it, what do you do with yeast? Where do you get it? What, 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 what's the involvement of it directly in your day in the brewery? It, it really is uh, 
the most crucial component, I would say, of my day. Everything I'm doing, whether it's changing the temperature on a tank, cleaning a tank to remove any bacteria, uh, creating, using grain to create sugar water, what we call wort in the, in the industry, uh, it is all focused on making that yeast happy because that yeast produces CO2 and alcohol. And so beer would not be beer without that yeast. Now, primarily there are two strains of yeast that brewers will use. There are, as you mentioned, hundreds, if not thousands, millions out there in the environment. But there are only really two that we found that work the best. And they're conveniently, that's the difference between an ale and a lager in beer. Every beer you've ever had with slight, slight modifications for an asterisk there is either an ale or a lager. And it's all based on the type of yeast that you use. Now, as craft beers grown, we're starting to see people bring in wild yeast, which gives whole new worlds of different flavors. One of them being Brettanomyces is a big one that is frequently used. And then mixing cultures of yeast. And again, it's infinite variables go into this procedure and this process and no two days are ever going to be the same as the result and that's i i'm constantly learning and constantly excited uh and i'll tell a brief aside um that nothing to do with me but to show you the power of yeast uh rogue brewery out in california i believe california oregon now i'm i'm questioning myself uh they sought to find a local yeast from their local area and I've seen people do this in Brooklyn too. Now it's pretty difficult to cultivate. There's a lot of different strains out there, as you had mentioned, floating in the air. And so you're catching most of them and most of them aren't gonna work for you. They jokingly took their head brewer, who I would argue is a master brewer, uh, a selection of his beard and said, oh, well, let's pull the yeast off his beard. He's been doing this for 20 years. It must be pretty well cultivated. Turns out that was the best strain they found and they made beard beer based off of that yeast that was found in their brewer's beard. Now, if you go look and see what this guy looks like, his beard is like a tree trunk, it's giant. Um, so who knows what critters were living in there, but it just goes to show the interest and the power of yeast and where, where it can reside and, and what it can do. Well, let me um, ask you to take a small tangent with me about beer and breweries. So growing up, I wasn't a beer drinker, but I knew a lot of people who were. I went to college at a, at a, at a university where um, they had three, two beer, which I, oh, yeah. which I assume um, simply was because of lower alcohol uh, content yep. was, uh, there, was a, there was a ceiling as to, as to what adolescents <laughs> could drink. Um, and beer was, was, you know, Miller, beer and and paps blue ribbon beer and um and and you know beer was just beer it seemed like there was no attempt to try to sell it as being you know unique in flavor you, you drank beer and you had pizza and hot dogs <laughs> and you watched football that was that seemed to be what the beer business was about at least from my eyes and the, there were huge beer companies. Um, some of them are still around independently and some of them have been aggregated. You've got, you know, Anheuser, and I know that they have an affiliation now or were bought up by some company in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. and in they, Bev. Okay. And they, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you started hearing the term microbrewery um, not as, not as much today, but I, I remember that term floating around and it suggested beer made in smaller batches by smaller companies using more unique, discrete uh, methods that supposedly improved, improved the taste of the beer. And then suddenly there were microbreweries of the sort all over the place and restaurants that also had, um, a, a brewery, uh, you know, within the, within the restaurant. So before we, um, let me let you embellish on that history or explain it better than I just did. But again, those just tuning in, this is uh, WPVM FM in Asheville. And we are talking to Drew Kostick, who is a brewer uh, with a interesting background transcending into uh, Taoism, uh, Tibetanism is if that's an ism, <laughs> the practice <laughs> the practice of law, and other things. But now a a full time brewer. So, 
tell us about that arc of, of history, so to speak. And yeah, so we're, we'll have to go back actually to the 19th century um, to, to really get the full picture. Whereas most beer was made at home and was usually made by women. So the original brewers of America were women and uh, something that we'd like to bring back and incorporate more women into the, the beer programs uh, here in, as the craft beer movement surges on. But as that process went on, uh, you usually had local hometown beers or, or local family beers. Then came the big bad prohibition. And what that did was wipe out any independent retailer of beer. It was nearly impossible to stay afloat. Many of these big companies that are still around now were the ones that survived that experiment, to put it kindly. Uh, and as prohibition was phased out, these companies uh, became aggregated, as you said, and became giant conglomerates. And all of a sudden you had all the beer in America being produced by, you know, five or six different companies. And that was the way it was for decades upon decades. Actually, you fast forward to the 1970s when Jimmy Carter is in office and his brother pushed him to allow the legalization of home brewing. Which I remember was a big, Billy, big, Billy Beer. Billy Beer, exactly. Yeah. Billy Beer is the, is the start of it all. And that forwarded an interest in a whole new generation of producing beer. So fast forward to the 80s, you start to see these guys in Sam Adams, Jim Cook, uh, Kent Grossman, Sierra Nevada. All these guys started making beer with whatever they could find, usually dairy tanks, trying to get whatever grain they could, battling the big boys. And this all interacted in the 90s with the farm to table movement, the authenticity of what you're eating, uh, where is it coming from, where are we sourcing it, a kind of um, a revulsion of this cookie cutter economy that had become the grocery store, uh, you know, packaging, packaging economy with, with numerous different fillers and additives and whatnot. Uh, so these two harmoniously met and started to support each other in the, the, the time microbreweries, craft beer, and uh, the farm to table movement. And it, they really grew through the 90s. And at the time, these big beer companies, at first they saw them as nothing but a nuisance. And then they saw them as a real threat and started attacking them and going after them and saying their ingredients weren't as good. And then they started copying them. And when you, when you have your antagonists start copying you, that's when you know you've hit the big time. And this started happening in the early 2000s, probably right around as I was getting into it, uh, you started to really, really see a surge of craft beer uh, double digit growth year to year, which has since slowed down as the markets become more saturated. But really, you saw people take interest and people take heart. And it's largely because of multiple factors, but the authenticity and the story behind it. We're Americans. We love an underdog. The ingredients got significantly better than they were in the 80s because people started catering towards uh, these organizations. And also it just became fresher. It wasn't macro produced. It was a micro production, meaning that everything was fresher. Everything was more local. Everything was similar to what it was like in the 1800s. And then you allowed for experimentation. And that was another key component. We didn't really have IPAs here for the longest, longest time. IPA is a, a technically a British style of beer that is completely different uh, in the terms of what an American IPA is versus what a traditional IPA is. And that became uh, an American source of pride in beer. And now you're seeing it in, in even the most beer centric cultures, such as Germany and Belgium, you are seeing breweries open up and producing almost entirely American style beers because that's what the youth wants. And so it's really become a full circle experience. Where beer is going in the future, I have my thoughts, but you know, the options are always out there. COVID changed almost everything for the industry. And um, it has changed my thoughts about what I want to do with beer too. And it's, it, there will be more things like COVID, I'm sure in the future that are going to have the same effect. But just like being a brewer or living in Poland or living in Tibet has taught me, you have to learn how to roll with the punches despite how neurotic you are. And uh, everything is going to break. Everything is going to change. You just have to be ready to uh, find that opportunity when it comes to you. So you s seem to have suggested uh, something um, that pertains to the quality or likability of the beer. You didn't use either of those terms in terms of freshness, which sparked a memory that I remember Coors um, and, and 
was first at it and then a couple of the other brewery companies were stressing that their beer was more satisfying because it was shipped for sh over shorter distances or was shipped in a particular method and refrigeration and so on and so forth. But I take it from what you said is there's no substitute for, in terms of freshness, to be able to produce the beer close on site to where it's actually consumed. Is that a true statement? Absolutely. I think the best beer you can get is on draft from the actual brewery that is making that beer. Your tap lines are that much shorter. Your staff is that much more knowledgeable about pouring the beer, explaining the beer. Um, and uh, really, there's beer is a, a fickle beast. There's a lot of things such as oxygen, light, that can really damage the product. And the further it moves, the more likely it's going to run into one of those potential spoilers, as we call them. And so you bring up cores. For the longest time, you couldn't get cores on the East Coast. It was kind of a novelty for that same reason, uh, because they didn't. They wanted to maintain the freshness. Now, I saying this, I want to disclaim, I have no problem with big beer. I know a lot of craft brewers do. They're looking to fight that fight. I'm incredibly impressed with the technical skill and knowledge that these breweries have where they can produce this same beer across the world in different facilities and have it taste the same way, akin to a McDonald's. There is something truly special about that. And frankly, I don't want to fault anybody for drinking Bud Light if they like Bud Light. Everybody drink what you like. Let's just be happy. Let's just be happy that we can drink. Um, and so in that sense, I, I, I'm in awe of the big companies. I just don't care to sample their product because it doesn't fit my palate. So let me ask you a, another question, again, as somebody who doesn't have much uh, native knowledge about beer. It seems like what has happened with beer in the last, again, decade, maybe longer, is um, a discernment of different qualities, different types, uh, just like wine. In other words, the people that are big on wine, cultish on wine, they have their all, all their rituals and ideas about it as well. You know, it has to be from this vineyard. It has to be uh, uh, put in oak casks or steel drums. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the, the, there was that famous commercial where some blindfolded guy could tell you not only where the 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 bear uh, the grapes were grown but which vineyard and, and which vine but <laughs> but but that seemed to be more uh connected again to location age but with beer you can go into a beer uh place a pub whatever a brewery and it's almost like you're at baskin and robbins i mean there's 34 different varieties some of them do have coffee some of them have chocolate and some of them have is is but that has nothing to do with the yeast per se I, i'm guessing that it just doesn't or maybe it does or does it have well, something to do with an additive like like a true lawyer my answer is yes and no um <laughs> so there you you're seeing a split uh, of and a, I, not really a split but more a growth of of the industry and you are finding that terroir feeling. There are, as I discussed, the beard beer. You're not going to get that yeast anywhere else. That grew in that man's beard. And that was that was kind of their terroir of developing that beer. Um, on, you're also seeing differentiation in styles based on where you are in the country. The West Coast IPA, uh, you've got the Hazy IPA, which is also called a New England IPA, based on where these styles were actually developed. And this goes back centuries with beer at a Kolsch is based out of the Kolsch region. And technically, you're not allowed to call it a Kolsch unless you brewed it in that region. Um, a Goza is from Leipzig because it was coming out of the Goza River. So these do have historical landmarks that fit behind them. But on the other hand, you can then produce an abundance of different product uh, using yeast strains and water chemistry uh, allows beer to become a more common beverage that everybody can enjoy together, whether where they are, but uh, also leads to infinite experimentation because there are these different variables in different directions you can take your beer. And I want to explore all of them. <laughs> I can't get enough of it. But unlike wine, if I'm following you correctly, um, wine in terms of region 
is geographically based as to you know the type of soil what's what's you know if somebody says well you can taste hints of peach or raspberry or whatever they seem to be saying that's either in the soil or in the air or whatever that's specific to that geography as to where the grapes were harvested it it sounds like that's not the, there's not nothing quite parallel to that with regard to beer. These locales where they develop it just happens to be where the intelligence was to create a variation. Am I correct in that? Very much so, but you're starting to see a shift in that too. Um, you're starting to see the supply chain for beer start to localize as well. So you're seeing maltsters, which are primarily located in Idaho and the Midwest, um, or hopsters, um, uh, which are generally the Pacific Northwest, you're starting to see those pop up in small levels in different local uh, area codes. So uh, Epiphany malt is one that is local to North Carolina where you can get local malt and that is gonna alter the flavor of your beer and also alter the marketing process, of course, because you're using all local ingredients. Again, that farm to table type notion. And so you are starting to see that develop where people are using homegrown hops, homegrown malt, um, and again, even sourcing their own yeast. And you, you can literally do that outside your brewery window. As you said, it's in the air. It's there. It's just a matter of cultivating the right strain for what you're looking to do. So, so it, it, it bounces between both worlds. OK. Um, just a few minutes left. And I wanted to talk uh, or have you talk a little bit about archetype. First of all, I, I think there are, you have two locations, but I don't know whether yes. the brewery is separate from the, dis, I'll call it the dispensary. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't know where you reside. And if somebody goes to visit the brewery, are you out there besides after you're done with your janitorial work, are you, are you out there serving the beer or mixing with the uh -huh. customers or tell us a little bit about how that works? Well, sure. I, I'm certainly there and I encourage anybody, including home brewers, anybody who's interested, just yell, hey, brew, Drew. Uh, you know, chances are you're going to find me in the back you know, unless I'm in the office doing some paperwork. Um, and then after every uh, brew day, every day that we're in the brewery, when we're done for the day, my assistant brewer and uh, my intern, who are both fantastic brewers as well, uh, shout out to Brendan and Tom, the three of us will sit down and have a beer because we revel in what we do. Uh, and, you know, nobody wants to stick around at a law firm after they've done all their legal work. <laughs> Nobody's having fun doing that, you know? We have that opportunity. And I adore, again, you can tell I talk too much. I adore sitting and talking to customers, figuring out what they like, what they want to see next, really getting a lay of the land. So it, it, logistically, I will say I'm primarily at the Haywood Road location. Uh, that's in West Asheville. We also have our downtown tap room, which I'll try to make an appearance at every now and then whenever I can. Um, but we have great events too. We have what we call Barkatype. Uh, we work with rescue dogs. Uh, once a month, we'll do a rescue event, which I plan on making sure that I am at every single one, regardless of it, it being my day off, because I personally have rescued uh, two dogs and I support that wholeheartedly. And it's been one of the best things I've done in my life. Um, and so I, again, anybody who wants to come talk about beer, just know you're in for the long haul. If you sit there with a pint for, with me, it's going to be probably four or five pints because I can't get enough of it. Well, uh, people can get in touch with uh, you, you well, Archetype by going to the website. I'm sure they can find that on their own, but what is it quickly? Yep. Uh, Archetypebrewing.com, I believe. Okay. And then they can come to the two locations and who who doesn't like someone who's into dogs and beer and music and all of that so you're a fantastic guest it sounds like you've got a great uh, opportunity um, in, in Asheville and we'll look forward to having you back on the show thanks Drew well thank you it's so kind of you to have me see you next time